today we're here with uh, Billy Moore. Um, if anyone's seen the film A Prayer Before Dawn, it's uh, all about Billy's life. It's based on, on Billy's life and uh, not many people can say that, mate. You've had a, a film about the life, which is based on a book that you wrote. Yeah. So Billy uh, Scouser, much like ourselves. Yeah. How, how do you end up... Uh, uh, the film, if anyone doesn't know, is about... You spending three years, was it? Yeah. In a in a prison in Thailand, very, very intense circumstances. Yeah. Um and yeah, so how, how does that all come about? How does it start, Bill? Let's take it back to growing up in Liverpool. Growing up in Liverpool, it was um I was the oldest, I was a six, and I always felt separate, different, and alone from my own family. Yeah. You know, like it's like I had a dad who was um you drank a lot. You know, I'm not here to say he's an alcoholic, and I'm not here to put him down either because you know I've got a family that that, that you know that loved them, and I love myself, but it's um, it was just difficult growing up. Yeah. Um, it was Where are you from in Liverpool? Speak originally. Okay. So when you say it was difficult growing up, was it was um, it was like like a Victorian dad. It was everything was like it, it was ruled with a with, with with an iron rod. You know yeah. what I mean? You know, you, 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 yeah. it, it was you know that kind of like time when um, that's what it was like. I think Bill, I had very similar really a lot of. Liverpool families, their dads didn't think twice about being violent, you know, mm. they didn't. It was just, and uh, it affects, it's affected everybody, you know, the, yeah. the number of fellas who, nowadays, it probably wouldn't be against the law, probably wouldn't be allowed, you know, yeah. more or less caught, but you only had to step out of line, didn't you? To, I don't even know if it was stepping out of line, when I, when it was, I think it was just, um, so I think he had his own demons to deal with. Yeah. yeah, but we were just kids, yeah. and we were innocents, and you know we was our hero, and you know we we, we you know we grew up and, and we and we craved well I did anyway I craved that acceptance and that love and that that intimacy and it was missing you know and that was missing for years and the only intimacy that we ever received was on a Sunday night uh, from my mum throwing a nick home through my through our air, you know what I mean yeah. that was the, the so only... it was just your mum and dad were, were cold with you in general or no my mum was great me my mum was you know me. When you say the neck on bill, just because it was contact, really. Yeah, it was contact. You, you yeah, felt was yeah. yeah. Is that is, that was the only kind of like you didn't get a hug or that was no, the only affection that really. When it was tactile, yeah, touching you. Yeah. My mum had like six kids in eight years, mm. yeah. so you can imagine how, how overwhelming that was. So for it. Overwhelmed, yeah. So we, know, we we were quite poor, you know. We 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 didn't have much, you know. We we, we survived on benefits, uh, you know, sauce buses, and you know, like I said to you earlier on, we you know we. We wiped our backsides on the newspaper, and you know we we had like bars of soap, washed our hair with that when we went to the went to like the swimming baths with the rest of the kids from school and felt freezing cold. Yeah, outside. it was just yeah. just felt a uh, just felt that different. You know what I mean? And um, I always wanted to escape from yeah. the households. It was like the atmosphere was quite volatile in the end. It was like there was a lot of violence. There was a lot of um, uh, beating. Sub I was subjected to a lot myself. Um, you know, and I witnessed a lot and it was quite difficult. And I was that small and that skinny. And I remember my mum saying to me one Christmas, and I was, I think I was nine years old, and she said, What do you want this year for Christmas? And we never had much anyway. And I said, I want weights. And she just looked shocked. She went, You're nine years old, son. Mm. Don't you want like a Millennium Falcon or a bike or something? I went, No, I want weights. And then she asked me why, and I said, Because I want to be big and strong so I can protect you. This was like, this is what was going through my mind at that time. It was like, you know, I wanted to be big, I wanted to be, I wanted to be like my dad, I wanted to, to be a boxer, because my dad boxed. Well, he said he did. I never really seen him. Um, but he used to have all these ring magazines, and and I thought then, you know, if I become a boxer, then I'll gain his approval and his acceptance. And I'll you know, join his club and speak. It was the St. Ambrose ABC. And... Um, not because your dad brought you along, you just decided one I day. I just decided, yeah, I thought I'll, I'll tuck her off my own back. I wanted, I tried, like, you know, I grew up in the era of, a, you know, Bruce Lee into the dragon, you know, like, like everyone was into kung fu fighting and um, it wasn't for me. I tried it, you know what I mean? I just there couldn't, they go. Yeah, just couldn't do it. Um, I never got picked for football at school. I was always the last and I was like, oh, we'll have him anyway, you know what I mean? How bad were things, Bill? I mean, did you literally, as a kid, Ever go hungry or anything like that, or were you always kind of like? No, there was always food. My mum would like she worked like I said, she worked in a novel. She worked every, every, uh, every hour. God sent nearly um, little jobs here, little jobs there. But my dad, you know, unfortunately squandered most of that in the bookies, and you know, if his tea was cold, it'd get through at the, you know, 
at the wall. And, yeah. You know, it was that kind of like, it was unpredictable fear. I got to a point in my life where I wasn't really uh, scared of getting it. It was when it was going to happen. It was like, it was the fear of like, you know, the flinching, like, just do it. You know what I mean? You know, because I became numb to the actual kind of struggles of that. But yeah, we never went hungry here. Uh, and, you know, but we never had much. Did you become immune to violence in a way? Bill? Yeah. It, it didn't really. I know it's always painful when you get hit, but it, it was kind of something you could roll with, you know. Yeah, well, I took it to school, really. I took all that, that fear and that, you know, I'd get bullies on the way to school. I remember this kid used to, used to chase me every day. Yeah. And I used to go, oh, I've got to go down this, 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 this road again and I know he's going to be there and I'd run like the wind. You know what I mean? And he'd always chase me. And uh, get into school and I'd be getting called names like you tramp and shit splash and, you know, because uh, he had loads of freckles. Got you. So you, you were I mean? like a tough kid growing up? No, or? I was dead skinny, me. Yeah. Pure ginger wig. Um, loads of freckles. So is that's, why, that's why, is that one of the, the factors why you took yourself down to the boxing gym and thought, fuck this? Yeah, it's like I wanted to be, I wanted to, I thought, of, you know, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired here. Got you. I got to a stage where, like, you know, I was going to school, I was getting, like, abused verbally, um, called names. Um, I'd go home and I, I, I'd get, like, physically attacked by my dad and uh, abused and uh, verbally and, and, you know, always told, you know, son of man and you'll never amount to nothing. And, you know, just, f like, my self-esteem was, like, on the floor. Got you. So this is, like, me growing up, uh, at a very early age, and, and there was there was there was there was five other siblings below me, so oh, I was you're never the yeah I'm the oldest, so I was never allowed to be like a, like a kid really. I had to take care of my younger brothers and sisters while my mum was working and my dad was in the boozer and you know I'd clean up the house and you know I'd make the tea. So I was like I was like an adult at an early age. So mm. I never had that, you know. And at the door, I remember like. Kids knocking at the door asking for our Tony or, or is your Kevin there or is your Kelly coming out and there was never anyone knocking at that door for me and I I got I, got, I don't know what it was I just got really jealous of my brothers and sisters and felt I just felt, I just said I got no one you know I can't I can't have a friend I've got no mates um, so I was an, alone and I, 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 I isolated a lot. So you had no child or no. as such really did you? No. So could other kids have you? No, and I remember there uh, just this this. Join this club and it, and, and I remember Paul King. It was he. He was uh, my trainer at the time. I was only a young kid, and he said, uh, "Get in the ring. You're gonna be sparring with this other kid." I was just putting my hands up because I'd seen it on the TV. What you do? How old you at this point, Bill? I was about ten, eleven. Yeah, you know what I mean. And uh, he went, "You've got a great guard. Just keep coming back." And so I did, and I went three times a week. And in the meantime, I was jogging, you know, and and then I got a the chance of me first fight because I'd, I'd been training a lot mm. and I ran home excited you know my dad will be made up here he used to sit in front of the telly and the telly would be right there he used to have these glasses on and the telly would be right up, up to him we never had a remote control back then you know what I mean so he'd be turning the telly over with his toes <laughs> uh, and he was like he couldn't even watch nothing he like it's just like just like an Al Ali dog just turning it over and um He'd be having his birthdays and I remember running in and, and, and I said, um, I've got this fight. He didn't even look at me. And I remember this like as clear as, as, as if it was yesterday. He went, well, if you don't knock him out, son, I'm going to knock you out. Not the hell. And that's the first round. And I was like, what the fuck, man? That's why I had all that. I was just full of it, all the fear. You know, and I went at this competition and, and I beat the kid in the second so round. So did that go along to watch you? No, he never. Open. The first time he never. But when I came back with a trophy... And I was still like scared and saying, you know, approaching him, saying, he said, Did you win in the first round? I went, No, it was the second. He went, Okay. And then he started to come along to these fights, but it was embarrassing because he was bevying and he was making a show of me. And I was just thinking, Ah, oh, I just, don't even want to meet. I started to, to, to grow in confidence and, you know, and, and to build some self esteem. Yeah through the, the fighting and, and the boxing. So is the, is the boxing kind of give you a little bit of a uh, friendship group and that at that point? Are you still a loner or...? No, I started to build like uh, relationships up with um, a few of the, the young boxers in there. Yeah. And I started to go out and meet people and stand on corners and talk to girls. So 
I started to feel confident in that area. You know, I didn't take drugs, I didn't smoke, I was quite fit, I was running every night. And, yeah. You know, I was winning fights all the time. Um, and I think it was just, like, I didn't need me that by this time. I didn't need his approval, I didn't need his love. You know, he was just in the way. Uh, As that Was that kind of a realisation? Was it, was it a bit like... You know, we were talking before, this, we came on about escapism and going down and get, getting in the boxing gym. Was that kind of like your escape from, from family life, from what it, the hardship as what it was? Yeah, I think growing up as a kid, I think you need, like, uh, nature and, and love. Yeah. And, approval. Uh, yeah. Uh, but you, you never know, got it really. No, more. no acceptance, no approval, no uh, well done. You know, just um, just just uh, I'm made to feel, like, like different. I mean, if you can imagine, like, walking past... Your own house and looking in, being an observer and thinking, I don't even fit into that family. You know, listening to like people say, you know, the apple never falls far from the tree, and yeah. you're the black sheep of the family. And that's they, these are the labels I grew up with. You know what I mean? You know, your ginger headed cunt, you know, son of mine. So I was just like, I was like Velcro. I had all these labels. Mm. I had no identity. Um, and then I got, you know, I started to. Um, that's to meet people and go out to spend a bit more time out. And then while the boxing was on a break, um, I started to, to mix with the wrong company. You know, I, I missed me training because, you know, the, the, everyone has holidays, yeah, you know, even the gyms. But you your structure I mean? and your focus has gone, so. That's gone out the window. And um, to, to get out the house, I started to, you know, they say, look, bad company corrupts good character. So I'm, I'm standing on the corners with with other lads who were there starting to smoke spliffs and, and take LSD and, and, you know, I started taking the same stuff, you know. How old were you at this point, Bill? I was 16 when I yeah. first started smoking cannabis and I had my ear bits off during that first break. How was that come about, 16? I was, um, oh, we, we were just rag-ass kids at the time and, you know, there was this kid, he was a bit of a bully and, you know, we, we'd, 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 we'd cough for this car and in the back of the car there was some Easter eggs and, and bits and bobs, and he said, I'm taking all these Easter eggs, and this is what happened. Hold on, just for anyone, Bill, who doesn't know what you mean by you cop for this car. Yeah. You basically stole the car. Yeah, from a... <laughs> we, but it was a... I remember what it was. It was a... I think it was an SRI. Yeah. A CAV SRI, years ago. I couldn't drive. One of the lads had, had, had robbed his car, and we were joyriding, and I was just a passenger, in yeah. it. You know, and um, in the boot, there was loads of Easter eggs. And this this lad said, I'm shaking all them there, man. And he's in your group, the lad, or? He just turns up that night. Yeah. He, okay. just, he just turns up out the blue. And um, he demanded everything. And we were like, nah. And they were like, just giving them. I went, no. And then it just turned into a fight where oh, yeah. he was sore. And I stood up and lost an ear in the, in, in, oh. in, 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 in the battle. Um, and I remember getting the stitch back, back on. I was in uh, Western Hospital. Yeah. 16 years old, tripping on LSD fucking lying on this uh, this bed having micro surgery to stitch this ear back on you know my mind was like just like like a confusion of like colours and like what's going on and you know and um, that was that was shown back on and then six weeks later I had to go back and it was like a like a, like a quaver <laughs> it was dead yeah. you know what I mean and the doctor was behind me tapping it and saying how many times am I tapping it I didn't want to lose it because I thought, you know what, this is it, I'm 16, you know, me looks, not that they were great at the time anyway. Yeah, I think they've got better as I've got a lot older. But, um, so when you, sorry, your ear comes off, yeah. um, does that change your character in a way, Bill? Cause you... It said it, it, it knocked me, you know, I lacked in confidence. I wore a plaster for about two years over it, just to, to, to the shame and the embarrassment. Just to take it back, Bill, because this was something that was most intrigues me. The fella that did you get the better of him though in the fight? I think it was a fair fight. I had him against the wall, and I think his only uh, option was to bite. Oh, that yeah. was it. He, yeah. he wasn't throwing blows. Um, he was in the corner. Really. Yeah, he was cornered. I was smaller, and my head was lower on his chest. And he, you know, he had the, he had the opportunity. The mad thing I find is so you're on LSD at that point at sixteen. Yeah. Fighting, stealing cars, like yeah. I, I know that sounds fucking mad to most people, mm. but like. Just to, to fill people in a little bit, was that common for, for someone your age and living in that place in Liverpool at that time? Or was... I suppose it was, yeah, because there was a lot of kids standing on corners back in the days, you know. There was booze, there was a lot of boozers about then, you know what I mean? And, you know, off licenses and, hmm. you know, everyone was on the Thunderbirds and, 
you know, it was all about the um, the girls and the, and the lads connecting, and that was your little clubhouse sort of thing. And you know, to meet someone, that's where you went, and you know, you, you're a hot blooded male, yeah, growing up, you know, and, and you're attracted to the opposite sex. That you know, you you're gonna you're gonna you know, curiosity kills the cat, and you're gonna do things that you wouldn't normally do. You know yeah. what I mean? And go to places that I wouldn't normally go, and that's what that's what happened. That's just like um. But I didn't realise that, like, once I picked up a drug, like, and I always say this, it's, it's, I've got an allergy to, to drugs, and I don't break out in lumps and bumps, I break out in crime, pain, misery, loss, and handcuffs, the lot. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it's just... It's a rabbit hole. It, yeah, it's just, I just have a, a weird reaction. Um, and I snowballed into using drugs pretty quick. Like, everyone else kept, like... You're still boxing? Which... At this point, you're... The interest went out the window pretty quick. Yeah. You know what I mean? I lost interest. Um, drugs became more important. Um, and it was like that snowball effect where I picked up a drug and then and it was cannabis. While everyone else was sitting in little flats listening to Pink Floyd and getting stoned. You know, I was smoking heroin and crack cocaine. You know, by the time I was 16, 17. And it just escalated to that yeah, point just and then, pretty quick pretty quick and you know and I just got a grip of me it was like you know when I was like I, I always reflect on on, on, on interviews and on where my life would have been going you know being in like the the um, I, I wanted to join the army you know I wanted to be a great boxer you know I wanted to make me mum happy and, 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 and proud of, of a son and you know, and then I picked up a drug and, and, and it, it took me down a different route. I think that route. was just a total crossroads, just picking yeah. up that first drug. Yeah. So where did the urge to travel come from, Billy? Did you always have it in you, even at this time? No. No, I didn't, I didn't think there was anywhere else apart from speak <laughs> that existed, really, you know yeah. what I mean? I was only young. Had you uh, never been abroad or anything like that? No. No, I never went abroad until I was 30. Really, yeah? Yeah, so we never, we, like, ah. Uh, like some of all, I think we won, We went to a Butlins holiday camp when I was a kid, and that was like the highlights of of my life yeah. growing up. Once Patelli, you've been there, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. it was Patelli, and you it was yeah. I worked there. What year was it? Yeah, Bill, you remember? Oh, it must have been about nineteen eighty one or something. Nineteen eighty two. Mm. I was I was really I was I was a kid. You know what I mean? I probably the only, served you. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was the only time that I'd um, that I'd ever been on holiday. Yeah, yeah. And like. So well, back to this. So you're on a you're on a bit of a spiral. Yeah. Using heavier and heavier drugs, um, using that as a bit of an escape. I assume to to how you were feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just it was like curiosity. Then it was like, she. I grew up suffering with a lot of trauma. Mm. You know, I was traumatized from an early age. You know, it's like you nurse your children and you tell them they're loved and you hug them. Then you know. You know, maybe they'll come out and turn out a better person, but when you're just feeling like, um, I don't know, it's, it was it's quite difficult to be honest. Uh, and I always struggle with it because, you know, it's like I love my dad, I really did, and I do still. Mm. Um, although he's passed away, it was um, it was like the escapism, the loneliness, uh, the feeling difference, the self esteem. You know, the, the, the lack of confidence, everything just got stripped away from me. You know, as soon as I picked up a drug and, you know, lost my ear and, you know, I went down this 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 this, this path where it, it was just self-destruct. And, you know, you're going through that path of self-destruction and taking these drugs. Is is the drugs is what's giving you the comfort? Yeah. From what you were missing? Yeah, it was an easy, um, it was like, you know, I'm wrapped up in like a cotton wool. Got you. Know? Yeah. There's nothing else outside of this bubble that can harm me. You know, I'm not thinking about nothing. I'm not obsessed about anything. So it's a case of numbing your, yeah. your kinds of like thoughts. Yeah, it was just numb. And then, you know, when the drugs run out, then, you know, you've got these intrusive thoughts and my head's obsessed and, uh, 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 and I need to do it again. And he's a berry. Got you. All this pain, all this misery, just just to escape uh, the feelings that were like surfacing all the time. And that was like for years that, you know, and um, I used to wake up having nightmares about like, when I was a kid, you know what I mean? Because it was really traumatic. Um, I can remember being in, in, in a relationship with this girl and, and I woke up screaming and she was like, what's up? And, 
And it was like, the dream was really, well, the nightmare was quite vivid and it was yeah. just about me dad. So I knew that he was the, the crux of like... Because your subconscious thoughts were yeah, always... He was the crux of like all the problems. and um, So um, that took me in and out of prisons, institutions for a very long time, you know. And I don't like glamorise it, but I, I spent like 18 years in and out of 22 different prisons. Did you think you'd become institutionalised? Well, or did you, didn't you... Didn't it bother you when you went to prison in the end or did you just kind of like roll with it or did did you kind of like hate it and hate being in prison? I hated prison. Didn't want to be there but you are adapt to your surroundings and then it becomes mm. home and then it's like, uh, you know, I realised at a point in my life that going away probably saved my life as well um, in some times because like I, 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 I remember like, you know, I, share, I haven't shared this for a long time and I was talking to my mum about it the other week I got arrested and I was my brother's in the army yeah you know he's he's like well established and he's been in there for over two decades and you know he's got he's big he's, he's high ranking up there and then um, he was in Iraq and I got arrested I had loads of like tablets down my shock and I was wanted by the police and, and I gave him my brother's name so I said I mean he's so many more and then um, you know, I was in the police in the, in the police station at, at, at Overdose and, you know, I was ended up in a coma in the Royal Hospital. Um, oh. And the police had phoned my mum and said, you got your son Tony here? And she was like in shock. What's going yeah. on? Tony's in the army. Has he been shot? She didn't know what yeah. was going oh, on. Oh my God. So I'm lying in this, um, in this bed. It was a week. I, I was in a coma for a week. I woke up, um, tied to the bed. And the first person that I saw was my mum and she was like sobbing and she was looking at me and the first thing I said to her was the police don't know who I am do they what I mean she went I had to tell them who you were son and I was like you're out of order it was all about me got you you know it was all about say you know what was going to happen next you know do you know who I am I'm going to go to prison it's all fault and not thinking about you know the suffering that she'd been through and the hardship that she'd had to suffer oh dear yeah um, so that was the that was the moment that changed everything for my life. That, that I went way. I went to um, I went to prison that that last time. Um, yeah. Oh, because you'd upset your mum, do you think? Or... Yeah, I remember. It was, I, I I ended up going to a Walton prison yeah. from the hospital um, after being um, processed by the police. And she came up on a visit, and she was sobbing, and I was sitting there, and I was raw. You know, all of the drugs had gone. And, she was telling me about the coma, you were nearly dead, you know, everyone was broken hearted and, you know, why do you keep doing this? And I just didn't know, I just didn't know, you know, I didn't have an answer for yeah. it. It was just like, I just couldn't stop, I was driven, mm. I was obsessed, I was like totally in the grip of this, um, this drug that was killing me and my family and everyone around me. It was what ruining, was this drug at the time? It was heroin. It was, heroin yeah, yeah, it was like, it was ruining communities, yeah. you know, it was like, it was like a silent bomb that landed in Liverpool in the 80s and started like, Robin, Robin so it was quite common for people to be taking heroin during the 80s and yeah it was um, it was quite common then I mean it's, it's different today everyone's on the spice and and, and, yeah. and, and all those legal eyes you know what I mean it's, um, back then it was like heroin like landed in Liverpool and, and ruined communities and you know people lost lives lost it was lives. an explosion really in the yeah, 80s was, of heroin was, wasn't it yeah, yeah. yeah sure. and I was just unfortunate to be like in that in that, in, that, in that environment at that stage yeah, in my life wrong place, wrong time yeah but like when she, when she come up and that I was like I can't cope here you know what I mean I've had enough and, you know like I was I think it was all 20 27 28 yeah this is it you're getting on and I remember standing on the landings and some old boy said to me you know what son it doesn't get any easier and we don't get any younger and I looked at him and I thought you know what that was the first there was a moment, you know, like of clarity where I thought, he's right. You know, and uh, try to ask for help. Uh, the help came in the door getting slammed. That was the, the rehabilitation we got. Uh, so we started to rebel. And I remember, it was the hottest day of the year, 2003. And uh, we were on the yard in Bolton Prison. Someone said, we'll have a shit off, we won't go back in. You know, it's nice. You know, just refuse. So, you know, it went round the, 
and round round the yard, it spread from like man to man, like electricity. And it was it was like it was mutiny. We were going to defy the system, you know. We were going to uh, shit off, and we refused to go in. And then someone had an idea: let's get on the roof, like, let's get on Walton roof. Why and did they want to get on the roof? They just take because they're extremists, you know. People like. We're already on the yard. Yeah. We're already in trouble. Fuck it, let's just get yeah. on the roof as well. Let's just get on the roof. But initially, it was because it was a nice day, really. And it was a nice you day. You out. Yeah. You're locked in a shell 20, yeah. basically 23 hours a day. The door's being slammed in my face yeah. all the time. Yeah. The heat it was, it was, it was... Stifling was, inside yeah, the cell. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and people just had had enough. Mm. And someone said, let's get on the roof. And, uh, you know, sounded like a great idea. And I, I remember this, this young kid, a little losty, he stuttered. A lot, and um, so if you asked a question, it was like just what is it? What do you want? Yeah, know what I mean. And we, 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 someone encouraged him to climb up onto this this roof, and he shimmies up this this drain pipe that had a cover over. How he got up was amazing. Um, even the screws must have been impressed. And he had a little rope tied around his waist that we'd all that been thrown out the windows, you know, sheets, and we we made like this knotted rope. And he's got to the top, and and the whole prison system. I was just like, uh, like just lit up, and everyone's banging the windows and screams and yelling approval and go where does they? And I looked up and he's standing there like Rocky Balboa with his hands in the air. And I just thought, oh, that's what I want, the attention. Yeah, you know that's what I want. It's just like I felt envious and, and quite jealous of him up there. And this other kid got up, um, and two other guys got up after him, and and then it was my turn. And I was the oldest out of these young kids at the time. I remember halfway up, Miss Screw was shouting, Mr. Muscle, you'll never get up there, you fat ass. And halfway up, I fell. My hands slipped because I was like, and I came down, I landed on the, the crux of my, my, my ass and I, it hit the bone of it and I was like, pain and, you know, and I had all that shame and I was filled deeply with it and I thought, I'm not, um, I'm not going to fucking sit here and let that, like, just I'm let it be. Another go. Another go. And, it's just saying this is something like a North Sea rescue in the end. Did you make yeah. it? Yeah, they were pulling me up. They were like, <laughs> fucking get him up. Making a twas out of What happened when he got to the top? So I got to the top and um, I go, yes! And I locked on my hands were in the air and everyone was cheering and then bangs were for me and I was go ahead, Billy! Wow. You know what I mean? And then yeah. it stopped. Just stopped as quick as it happens and it was about the next guy and it was over. And I thought, what have I done? You know what I mean? And I stood up there for like... Um, 15 hours on the Otter stay of the year in a pair of undies throwing coconut oil over me. Bad mistake, you know, pale prison skin. Ended up with heat stroke. And and the embarrassing uh, thing was it came down on a cherry picker on a stretcher three oh. o'clock in the morning. Just heat stroke. It was At like the time, it. Bill, were you kind of a main player in prison or did you try and keep just to yourself kind of thing? I was, um, I was like, I don't know. It's just... I don't think I was a main player, but I was like, I was in there, I didn't You, you respected, yeah. Yeah, I, I, but I'd get involved in anything, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I, was, I was never shy. You were never afraid, yeah. No, no, I was like, I'd be down the block constantly. Yeah. I was always fighting and, um, you know, I'd force on the... Um, you, I, never, you never backed down to no, anyone, no. No, and, I, yeah. and, and it was always this, like, I remember shitting, shitting down and thinking, you know, all my life, all I've ever done is fight and box, you know. Yeah. I fought in school, I fought on the streets, I fought in the household, I fought in the ring, you know, fought on the prison landings. And the biggest fight I've ever fought was, was with how I felt and was admitting vulnerability and admitting fear. You know, I had a label in jail, oh, he's nuts, he's psycho, he's off his cake. I, I enjoyed that because I reveled in that. You because felt secure that's and a yeah, mask in it, yeah. Yeah, it was a mask. I was a I was a great pretender. I'd come out, but yeah. that door got shut. And I'd be shitting in this pad and I'd be like uh, broken hearted. You know, I'd be I'd be looking at the shadows walking past Michelle, you know, giving letters out and not seeing any come under the door for me. So you nobody know. could really kind of get next to you. You never kind of like No. Revealed who your true self was. You didn't take anyone in. No. Into your confidence. That's what you'd become. Yeah. That kind just, of like an ice man, really. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was just dead. Yeah, that was that was probably just as cold as as you can imagine. But you know, there was there was there was something breaking. You know, Inside. Getting, yeah, so getting, when no letters and stuff were coming through, is is your mum not trying to reach out to you at that point? Or she had enough. The whole yeah. family has had enough. It's really like, look, brilliant. Bill, you've been in and out. You've wrote letters from jail, promising us the world. Yeah. Uh, and I could pass. I tell you now, if you had a, a lie detector in here, yeah. 
I, I, I passed because I was that convinced. I was. I, I really meant what I was saying. Yeah. I really did. I'm going to change. It's going to be different. And I, 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 and the minute I get to that gate, every fibre in my body was screaming. Just have, just have one drug and you'll be okay. Yeah. Just take one, and it was just like it was overwhelming. And I go, yeah, it'll be different this time. It will be different. Bang. A couple of months later, I'm back in the same place, back Got in yeah. prison, doing it again. Cool. And, and my family just went, we're washing our hands, are you, son? Yeah. And it was the best thing they ever did. You know what I mean? Did it kind of shock you that then, Bill, when your family saying, the back on you really? Did, did that kind of shock you into kind of thinking, I've got to reinvent myself here, I've, got to, I've really got to change, I can't keep falling back into the way I was and... Yeah, Making you start. Yeah. I think what happened was the, the enabling. When you know when the when the enable, you know, oh, come on, you know, you, you know, I'd go to my mum's and come on, let's tell her, you know, when I'm talking yeah. to her, so, and she'd go, no, go to Fiverr, no, give us a C then, no, all right, just give us a fucking biscuit then I'll go. I couldn't leave the house unless he had some. I had to take Got you. something. You know what I mean? That's you know you're what trying, I mean? Do you think that's because you're trying to fill a hole? Yeah, or? it was just like you know. In the end, our kids used to shake me hand through the letterbox, look. You know what I mean, lads? <laughs> just like, you're not coming in. They didn't want to know. They just yeah. didn't want to know. Why don't yeah. you die? And I was like... And then when I'm on my own, right, and there's nothing there for me to take and, 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 and it's just, it's all gone and, mm. you know, I start to, like, feel and, and, and I start to realise that, like, I am on my own in, in this world and, you know, um, changes start to, to happen. And it was down uh, when I come off that roof and a uh, roof and I'm I'm, I'm in Armley Leeds on, on on this unlock. We got Shanghai's everywhere, we got like dispersed. All the lads that had jumped on the roof. Yeah, there was fourteen of us and we all went all over the country, you know, yeah. London, Pentonville, Wandsworth, uh, Leeds, you know, we just got dispersed everywhere. And I'm down the block in Armley for eight months and um I'm in this shell, I've got mm. this like a uh, prison red and blue Spider-Man tracky on with a pair of slippers. They wouldn't give me a razor to get a shave. So I had this big balaclava for a beard on. I had an head on me like a bed pack. I was like, all I was doing was press ups in, in, in the shell. I was writing to Charlie Bronson and he wrote back. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was reading books about pretty boys sure and gangsters, they're crazy. And I wanted to become them. And, and this is how, how I was started. I started to read a lot more, you know, and what I read, I became um, so I was definitely not reading Mills and Boone's romantic, <laughs> romantic novels because you know so it was like um, yeah it's just, I was a great pretender but it was this one moment where uh, this, the kid next door to me asked me for a light I was smoking uh, back then as well um, and I had to get one of the cleaners down the block to come to my part it was all a mission you know mm. and he got to come to my shell and and give him a light, and then I'd eat share his cigarette with me, and you know, by the time the cleaner came to the cell and got the match to this kid, he killed himself, he dung himself. Oh, he's joking. No, and um, he was only 22, and he, he'd been, uh, he, you know, he's doing a life sentence, and it was just shards, and it was like, um, then the kid, a couple of days later, next door to me, he'd killed himself, so there was two, there was two separate incidents down, down the segregation unit where mm. two guys had killed himself, and uh, I was in the middle of them. And I remember, this is the like the, the like the moment where I reached out. You know, I remember asking the prison officers could have used the phone, and they were being a little bit like, you know, like sensitive to everyone. Yeah. And they're, oh yeah, you sounds oh, don't, don't want you to arm yourself. You're okay. Looking in the flap, checking on us for the change instead of just leaving us for days. Um, and he said, okay, yeah. So, you know, I wanted to phone my mum. I hadn't spoke to her for a long time. And I didn't know how she'd react. I didn't know how she'd respond. Um, and I remember these two big, two, two big screws marching me to the phone. I'm standing right beside me, and I'm on this phone, and 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 it's dialing, and I mean, my mum answers, and, and she goes, "Who is it?" I said, "It's me, mum. It's Billy." And she said, "Oh my God, Sonny, you're okay." Mm. And and the love that came out of her, um, out of her soul. Yeah. Uh, because she's heard of the tragedies in the prison, yeah. No, she just hadn't seen or heard. Oh, really? And I just thought, they don't care, they don't want to know. Yeah. I stopped writing letters, none were coming in. All the promises that I, you know, all the empty promises. And, um, and I heard a voice and I, and I couldn't answer. 
it was like the first time I had this big lump coming up. My eyes started to well up. And I thought, if these two see me crying, you know, uh, they're going to laugh. And uh, she went, son, I know you're hurting. You don't have to say nothing. Uh, just get help. Just ask for it. Wow. And I went. Put the phones on. So I deep breath, held her in, swallowed it. Yeah. Got into the shell, the jaw got shot, and I just sobbed. Just sobbed. Like I'd never sobbed in my life. It was like, um, it just all come up, and it was just, like, just, it was just really coming out. And, um, and then those words resonated in my mind. Just ask for help, just ask for help. Yeah. And I wrote a letter to the probation officer, and um, that was in 2003. And he came up to see me and offered me a chance of rehabilitation. And I, and I went to one and got picked up from the prison gates when my sentence finished and got taken to Bristol to this treatment centre called Barleywood. Yeah. It's no longer there. Mock Tudor Mansion uh, in the middle of the countryside. And um, it was amazing. You know, and I walked in there and, and my life started to change. I got an understanding of addiction. I got um, an awareness of, of how I operated and, you know, I behaved. You know, it took a long time. There was a process, but this was my journey. Did you, you know? make friends there, but or did you still feel isolated? And I walked in, right, with a prison bag, with a toothbrush hanging out of it, a gym vest that I dropped, <laughs> a, a, a pair of Lacoste bottoms that were green and, and a blue Lacoste top that had pop bands in it, with a skinhead and the street mentality of, like, an hard case, you know, right? Yeah, Simon. yeah. Uh, and then I'm in there and, and, and people are breaking me down, you know, uh, challenging me and, and questioning me and, you know, looking at me denial and my addiction. I was like, wow, you know what I mean? But um, it was deadly, stands offish, and it was like that. And I did. I remember that the, the, the councillor bought me a, um, a boxing bag. We bought one and put it in because I just wanted to be on my own. I just beat, you know, I thought I could just punch these demons out of me. And um, it wasn't, it was about connecting and communication and, 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 and speaking to people and, and getting vulnerable and sharing honestly with others and that took some time um, but then I started to learn you know I started to learn it was okay to be vulnerable it was okay and then I'd listen to other people's stories and I could identify you know, because I thought that was the only one I thought there's, there's no one like me there's no one like um, who's been through what I've been through when I sit in these uh, these groups and listen to other people go through their shit their stories and I think it's a shame. And then I'd get um, really, um, you know, I'd find the courage to, 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 to share a little bit about myself when I heard them being really honest. I thought, wow. So I learned, I started to, and then I went to these meetings where, you know, people helped each other and, and I got clean. Yeah. I got a, a day clean. And then I got a week and then a month and then a year and then two years and it was like, this is abstaining from drugs. And then I was like, a 30-year-old, 15-year-old uh, kid, if you know what I mean. I was, in a, I was a man who was, in, uh, 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 who was uh, acting like a teenager because life was just, you know, I was the age I was when I... Did you realise at the time that you'd been on a totally incredible, your life journey that like 99.9% .9 of people hadn't been on? Did you, did, did, you know, the, the life that you'd led? Mm. Did, did you kind of take that on board or were you just kind of oblivious to it you were just kind of going from one prison to the other and then re rehab it was just kind of like you were rolling with it or yeah. did you did you suddenly realise you know that people don't live like this or did you feel unusual in any way or I felt um, there was something like a spark that was going oh you're better than this you know you're not a junkie yeah. you're not that label you know you've been called this all your life um, you know, stands up for something now, or you'll fall for anything. You know what I mean? You'll become that man on the corner, you know, drinking a bottle of shards. You... Bill, did you always have those thoughts when, you know, you're talking about when you're in the situation um, earlier where you had that mask on and you were, you were playing that role of that person who was dead tough and, and didn't really give a fuck? But then I'd, were those thoughts always in the back of your mind? Were, you, were they always suppressed or did they just kind of come out? when you got to, to the rehabilitation? I, th I think it came out when, after, a, let's say, a couple of, couple of weeks, I started to um, 
I started to open up. And then people used to say to me, you know what, lads, you're all right, you, you know. And I had a, I was like, what's their agenda? What's his motive yeah. for saying I'm okay? You know, all my life I've been called this, that and the other. Yeah. You know, no one's ever said, Bill, you're okay. You know, we like you. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, it was always like, what's in it for me? You know, because I've, I've got to look at like, through me, through um, my inability to accept personal responsibilities, I was actually creating my own problems and um, my own consequences. So everything, you know, the positions that I was in is because of, of the way I was behaving. Right. So once I started to, um, I knew that I didn't like what I was doing. Yeah. Even when I was doing it. Yeah. When I was using it. I didn't feel good about it. You know, I'd, I'd feel shame and I'd but feel guilt. it was just a coping mechanism. Yeah. And, and the more drugs I put in my body at that time was, you know, blocked out the shame and the guilt. Yeah. Um, and then you take away the drugs for good. And then that shame and guilt, you know, you've got to deal with it. And so that's, you, you're dealing with it, you're two years clean at that point, aren't you? Did you say? I was two years clean. And um, almost, yeah, two years clean. And, um, you know, I was living in Bristol. I relocated by this time. Yeah. Kind of at this, kind of thinking that like Liverpool was the problem. Okay. So I was still going through like the blame. It was the society, the society I was brought up in. It was the area you know, I lived in, it's the people I'm, I'm, I'm around and, you know, if, if I stay away from them, I didn't realise I was the problem, that the problem was in built. Yeah. You know, so, I relocated to Bristol, uh, spent a bit of time up there, met a few guys, built a few friendships and one scouser who was up there, he was in recovery clean, five years, he, he'd been to Thailand and told me about the, the wonderful experiences he'd had over there and, and would have come along, you know, would like to, you know, go backpacking. The sound of backpacking, I thought, you know, that was, yeah, I'll do that. Well, you've well, never been abroad at this point? Nah, no, no. So, I'd, um, I'd saved a little bit of money. I, 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 was, I, was, I was doing little odd jobs for guys in the, who, 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 were, who, who were new up there, like, labouring and that, and, and putting my money away. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I... I, I so my, my financial affairs were a little bit better. I'd saved this little bit of money up and got a passport and got all the things that normal people have. Yeah. Bank accounts. <laughs> never had one. Until the age of 30. You know what I mean? Um, a passport, I never had one. Uh, Travelling, I'd never been. And we, we went to Thailand for three months and that was like... What was it like? You know, it, it was exciting. It was... Um, it was exotic. It was amazing. You know, I'm a world class card carrying pleasure seeker. You know what I mean? I, I want to feel good. You know, I'll, I'll squeeze myself into a tight pair of shoes just to, to get a feeling. You know, because I'm not feeling anything else at the time. You know what I mean? I'm, so I, I'm, 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 I'm there and, I, and I, I'm, I'm walking down Pate and I've got hundreds of thousands of girls running up and down saying, I love you. What your name? And you don't get this on our council estate. You know what I mean? No one's ever said I love you. I want you. You're mine. And, you know, it was all fantasy, but it was like I did. I enjoyed it at the time. Um, the fantasy of it all. And you know, I'd watch the Muay Thai boxing and those they lost dreams reawaken. You know, I'd boxed for England yeah. as a schoolboy. I'd had many fights. I'd boxed in Ireland. I'd, you know, I, I believed. You know, I had the, the skills to to continue. And um, a friend said to me, "Don't get in the ring with these ties. They'll bust your heart up." And you know, you tell me not to do something, I'll do it anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I'm quite immature sometimes in that way. And I got in the ring and I got my ribs broken in the, in, in the second round and I went back for more six weeks later. Just sparring with them or did you just go for a proper fight with oh, them? I go for a proper fight, mate. Yeah? Yeah. So you joined the club, did you, Bill? A kind of boxing club out there where you could fight out that it worked? Nah, I was freelance. I was, um, I was living in, we, we ended up in Chiang Mai. Yeah. And there was this bar, uh, and it had a ring in it and there was loads of bars around it and loads of tourists come along and you know, people could get in the ring and some people would be show fighting and I thought, ah, I want to get in there and have a fight. Yeah. So um, I seen this old couple, I didn't know their names, I couldn't pronounce it, I just call them my ma papa because they, 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 they just like they were just like a really nice couple and um, you know, I said, can I get in? And he went and said, you know, yeah, but will you go round with this box, this tip box? Really, yeah? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> After the fighting, 
you know, that'll, that'll, that'll fine and sure, you know, us and, and you getting in the ring and that. And I was all right. So I got in and, and I started to do that every night. And because I was a foreigner and I could communicate with the Taurus, I'd manipulate them. Oh, yeah, they're in the arse. Help them out. What do you mean? God, yeah, so, yeah. You're, so they're made up with you fighting every night. Yeah, yeah. Because you're getting a few quid for yeah, the tip so, box. So I became like a part of it. And then it was it's because it's, it's, it wasn't a club. What it, what it is, it was just like a lot of boxers in Thailand, you know, they brought up. And, and they were teaching me uh, their martial art. Yeah. Uh, You're enjoying it, Bill? I was, yeah. yeah. You know, I was, I was keeping me fit. Um, I didn't smoke. Um, I was just drinking water and eating healthy food. And, you know, I was in the ring regular. I was getting paid little tips now and so then. At that point, like, you know, being through what you've been through. Yeah. And, and the years of, of being in prisons and drug abuse and all the rest of it. You must have been thinking, fucking hell, it's like a new star for me. Yeah, it was. It was like a new beginning and um, like a new chapter in my life. Uh, I felt, um, you know, I wanted to live here yeah. by this time. You know what I mean? I wanted to learn a new language, adopt a new culture and um, stay. Yeah. And uh, me mate, when we're going back in, in, in a week, you know, and I went like, nah, I'm staying. Yeah. And it was like... He said, what? I said, I'm staying. I said, look, I've got no girlfriend, no wife, no kids. Are you speaking to your family at that point? Yeah, but they're all right. They've, they've, I've been out of there like big gaps anyway, got you know you. what I mean? And um, I just said, you know, you can go back, I'm staying. And, and that's what happens. I, had, I, start, I thought I need to finance my me, uh, me, me life while I'm here. So yeah. I got a job as a teacher. Right? I took it, um, a course a TEFL course teaching English as a foreign language and passed it. And then I thought, that's good, that's a good qualification, yeah. you know what I mean? And then I bought a bachelor's degree online. Uh, I went into the school. He says, you know, they're all looking for English teachers. Shout, all right. Give us a job. Give me a job the first day. Started to teach these kids. Didn't have a clue, didn't have a lesson plan. Learned about that as I went along. Um, what was that like? Good. It was mad. All the kids were like shining like little Larry Enfields. What's happening there, lad? Everyone's talking scouts. Yeah, they were like... I was just going to say, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you've got a good scouts accent. Did they end up talking up scouts to the yeah, kids? Yeah, it was... Um, I ended up having to get the sack really in the end because it was like... It, it wasn't working out. And um, I needed to pay the bills. I was fighting in the ring every single night by this time as well. Teaching of a day. So I was, I was up early... I was quite physically fit at the stage at that stage, you know what I mean? So I had, you know, a lot of uh, endurance and te- I was teaching English, fighting overnight, lost the job at the school, uh, still needs to maintain kind of like a roof, a roof over my head and finances. Yeah. And then I got a job uh, working for Sylvester Stallone, which was just out the blue. I was in a gym in uh, Chiang Mai, North Thailand. I recognised this guy, I thought he was one of these fighters, but he wasn't, he was, his name's Matt Marsden, and he was an actor from the UK, and he was in Coronation Street at yeah. the time. But I didn't, I, I didn't really watch Corey, I wasn't really a show fan or anything. He just looked familiar for whatever reason, and he, he told me that he was on, he was over there doing this, this movie with Stallone, and I was like, oh, that's great, I enjoy it, mate, what's he, what's he like in that? And then, yeah, you know, we're enjoying it, and, you know, a couple of days later, the casting crew come in the gym looking for um, non-size or Westerners and took our names and took a picture and, and, and our details and asked would we like to be extras. And I said, yeah, I'd love to, yeah. And a week later, he got in touch and said, um, some American bird, we'd like you to be Sylvester Stallone stunt standing. How do you feel about that, Billy? I was ah, who's this? Who is it? Come on. Tell so someone's wine, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's mad though. It's, it's interesting the way, you know, most people you're talking about people living normal lives before. Yeah. Yeah. You get to the point in the story where you go, so I'm in Thailand and someone just said, you know, uh, do you want to be Sylvester Stallone stump? Standing. Standing. It's yeah. like, that, that's fucking madness, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, are you a big Sylvester Stallone fan Oh, yeah, they grew up on Rocky. But what does that mean, but the, the job description stunts? What what did that entail? Well, that, that entailed that like what I, what I learned as I went along is that you worked on unit one, which was closest alone. Yeah. So you were you wherever he was, you had to be. So you were on roll call, and um, your name was on on the list. Billy Moore, Sylvester Stallone, Stone Stanzel. Oh, 
Yeah. Get on that. Um, What's he like? Oh, he was sharp. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, he was like he was never out of character. I remember he, uh, he, I was standing and we were watching this scene, right? And he was standing there and he had to rip this uh, this Burmese soldier's windpipe out with his bare hands, right? And um, did I need a volunteer? I was out of it. My hands went right up. He's my yeah. hero. Why stood there? He's got his, got his hands around my throat. So, because what they do, this is what Stone stands in, does Frank. It's like they'll set the lights and the shadow and the camera. So, they'll set all the camera. He's there doing what you're doing because he can go and sit off. I'm holding a bow and everything. Got his bow, you know, just just for yeah. the silhouette. Ah, um, so you're in his place and yeah. then he just jumps in. He just jumps it. in. Got, he just yeah. jumps okay. in. Um, I'm not doing all these big blown up moves, like, but it's. It, 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 it was it, it was interesting and I said to the um, Kevin King and he's a scouser Kevin King and he's his manager so it was mad uh, I said to Kevin I said nah I'm not having it mate no one can rip out someone's windpipe with the bare hands and he went Rambo can <laughs> but it was um, so that was a uh, that was a great experience and I was still like a little kid in, in, in a sweet shop, you know, and I was getting loads of pisses with him and he was chewing his head and he couldn't understand a word. I was saying, oh, Kevin, get some subtitles for this guy. And um, I was going, just like, yeah, yeah, sounds and all that. Yeah. I'm just like a social butterfly by this time. So that was brilliant. Um, and I enjoyed it and I met some great people and I'm still in contact with them today. Um, and then it ended, as things do. How long were you doing that for? I think it was about five months. Yeah. Did you yeah. enjoy your build? Yeah. Good part, good part of your life for you. It was. It was. It was like it was. Just, I was. I was young. I was single. I was free. You know, and um, I'd lived this horrible like way You're of clean living. then, Bill? Or you yeah. Just, not you messing know. about. No. Yeah. When I'm not clean, you'll know about it. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm, I'm locked up. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm doing things that I shouldn't be doing. Um, so I'm I'm living the dream and I'm living this like this I'm enjoying life and yeah so you know as everything ends and um now fighting for green curries again overnight couldn't get a job working as a teacher you know and I remember meeting this girl she was Thai she couldn't speak a word of English she was gorgeous and she wasn't a bad girl and she was different and uh, this is the one. Like they always have been, these birds are always the one. And um, I had to communicate with the dictionary. You know what I mean? And I found out she was with this fella. Something moody was going on. Couldn't uh, she wouldn't answer the phone at the weekends. Yeah. Right. She wasn't working at the weekends. Weekdays, it was all all good. And I got a little bit paranoid and a little bit like suspicious. And you know, and I confronted her and she said, uh, I have boyfriend, but I love him. Same, same you. And I was like, uh, where I come from, it's either me and you, and that's it. Not me, you, and your other fella. But here, yeah, no, no problem. And I was like, <laughs> no, nah, it wasn't. And it broke my heart. Yeah. Because yeah. I couldn't, like, I couldn't. Is that like, the first girlfriend you'd had properly, or? No, I mean, it was the first probably one I'd been, like, was clean, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. You know, being with, like, with girls, and, you, know, you know, it was just drinking and what have you, but, like, where like I'd give up my art and everything, my shawl I wore it yeah. on my sleeve. Yeah. You know, I was dead romantic. But that was, was just normal things. for a two-time thing with them. They couldn't yeah. see any. Problem nah, they couldn't see. It. They couldn't see a problem. You know, I, yeah. I, 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 um, you know, I, I, I was just mad. It was like, um, you know, I, I was, I was like, I'd give you everything. Mm. You know, if you wanted me, you could have me because I didn't think anyone loved me. Yeah. I got to that 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 way of life where you know, you know, if you said like, you know, I care for you, then I'm yours. You know what I mean? Um, and, 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 I, and I felt like I loved this girl and, and she broke my heart and, and, I, and I, that was the first like, time that I, I, I felt like all these uncomfortable feelings and I felt really peculiar uh, about uh, the way it was turning out and I couldn't cope uh, and I got in the ring and, and I boxed even more you know because I learned that like in the ring you could put like a plaster on a cut you know but outside you know when I, I broke an heart you couldn't you could that that that's well, empty that. at the time. Yeah. Building. Well, this is dead interesting because you know we were talking earlier. We, we mentioned this in the last podcast about mm. Frank always feels more comfortable on stage as your pers- stage persona. Do you feel more comfortable in the ring? I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Felt more comfortable doing something. That was like my escape route. Mm. It was uh, it was me against him, and there was no one else in the way. 
you know, life didn't go on outside. Of course. It didn't happen. But once that ended and I'm out, I've got mm. to deal with people. I've got to face people. Yeah. You know, I've got to face my feelings. Um, and, and, and I remember, like, just, like, I was, I was broken. This girl wouldn't speak to me. It ended and... You know, and there's all these mad thoughts. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna. Do, I want that back. You know, like childish behaviour. Yeah. Um, and I remember just like sitting in a bar and looking at this bottle of whiskey. And I don't even drink whiskey. I wanted brandy. I hadn't touched nothing for years by this time. And every uh, everything was telling me it was wrong. You know, but there was that little something that was saying, "But yeah, it'll make you feel better." And, and, and I knew it wouldn't. And it was like, it was a pull. And I picked it up. And this is where it just went, like, sits up. And I picked up that glass. And I, I must have looked at it for about 20 minutes before even putting it to my lips. Because I was just fighting with it. And then it just went, just fucking kicked it in. And bang. And that was it. The minute that went in. Downward spiral. Yeah, another one. I want something different. I want cocaine, couldn't get cocaine. This lazy boy took me and this other guy to, to this, like, the back streets and we ended up smoking crystal meth in Yabba. Uh, amongst all these tires, he was sitting there with big machetes and knives and, you know, it was on a, a cloudy, smoky room and it was like, no one could speak English and I was just, like, taking this drug that, like, had me paranoid anyway by this stage and, and uh, I'm thinking, I don't want to come down off this. We need some, we need some real gear here yeah. and uh, we need to get some, some stuff. The kid went, look, we have to go to Burma to get that. And fucking hell, let's go then. We just jumped on a motorbike heat and just flew all the way to the Burmese border. How um, long after you've had the, the, the first drinks, this? This is like the same night. The same night you just oh, yeah, yeah. fucking spiraled from that? Yeah, I told you. I don't stand at the bar like a... Last <laughs> like, going home now, mate. I'm just going to put this down. I don't want no more. Nah. Yeah. nah you want another? Nah, I'm okay. <laughs> Sound. It doesn't end, right? Let's go, fuck it. Let's just go. Just go, and like, it doesn't end. Nah, nah, not, not just one more. So I'm, 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 in, I'm on the way to Berber by this time. And we got into, into the country. And uh, we had to buy this, this, this heroin, you know what I mean? Mm. China White. And this, uh, no one could speak Thai and no one could speak English. And I was trying to like, explain to them what I wanted. Mm. They were trying to sell me like the nans and. And like herbal flip flops and bifters and, and Viagra. I was like, no want that. You want lady? I went, no fucking last thing I want. I went, so what Edwin? And then she stands it, Edwin, and he went. So I throw the picture of a poppy. And he went, ah, punk cow, punk cow. I went, whatever that you could, yeah, I want yeah. that. We got this, um, this capsule and, and it was just like, like, like it must have been a. It was, Pure unadulterated China White, which is heroin. Um, we smuggled it back over the border, and, and uh, we had it. And I didn't use it; stays away. It was like it was again another battle. It, yeah. was, it was taking it to another level. And then I took it, you know, a few hours after I got back, and then that was it. You know what I mean, it was like I was in the mix then. You know, I started using more yabba, which is translated into crazy drug, to um, to fight more. Uh, okay, why what's Yabba like? It's like a uh, crack cocaine souped up. Okay. Like it's like like a like a speedy kind of like amphetamine type of drug. Um so that kept you awake and the other kept you down. So I was like trying to get a balance but I couldn't. You know, and I was taking that much, I was getting that paranoid and uh, you know, I had um, I had this corrupt police officer bringing me the drug and you know, and I, and then I started selling little bits, you know, low level to to to, to, to fund me abbey. Yeah. And it was starting to get a little bit like, you know, like I was getting riding in the mix by this time, riding the grip of things, fighting overnight. Were you getting kind of like well known in, in that Thailand area? Yeah. Then where yeah. you were, Bill, everybody knew you. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, you know. You, you were a kind of like local celebrity, really, I suppose. You were. Yeah, yeah. There was you yeah. being Liverpool, English, and. Out there, yeah. Yeah, there was, there, it got to, you know, yeah, everyone knew who it was, you know, all the other boys, you know, you know what I mean? But, yeah, when right. I was like, they're like, ah, you like, get a new face, but now it was like, you know what I mean? He's here again. On, and I brought all the, um, like the side boxes, I could start to speak a little bit of time, not much, but just passable, and, and I could understand, and, you know, and they were teaching me little bits of, little bits and bobs, and, um, 
you know, I was wheeling and dealing, uh, 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 just little things just to, just to keep like... Did they kind of take to you, or was there a kind of a, you know, bit of animosity because they, cause you were English, British, and it, they thought you maybe to review the English out there as being like sex tourists, that the men yeah, and don't like yeah. them, and that they've got they kind of like, uh, not a jealousy, but they're not really keen on, uh, from what I, I can gather, how, how did you feel, or were you, it's, did you get close to them? I, I was young as well, so it was like, it was more like directed at like the older generation, you yeah. know what I mean? I was I was like just out for a party, you knew that, you know what I mean? I was just a party head. Uh, so I was probably with them judging. <laughs> Got you. Bastards, get on him. Um, How dare he? Have fun. Um, but yeah, uh, I was. It was like it was just got to a stage where, like, my life had like got so small again. You know what I mean? Yeah. I stopped there uh, doing what I was doing. Uh, that was keeping me clean. Obviously, you know, that was like above all being honest about yeah. what was going on. Um, then you get to a point where you're like, you know, doing what you're doing, selling all the rest of it. Yeah. And, and what happens next? Well, I was. I was that I was getting because I was uh, I was getting really paranoid. I was buying of swapping phones. Okay. And I bought this phone. Off, you know, some guy for for a few tablets or something like that, and it was stolen. And I wasn't really asked. I knew, you know what I mean. I, I couldn't yeah. care less. It was just a different shame. It was different because he had this this like like master plan in my mind. You know, if you if you ever see something like cocaine or or anything that kind of resembles that, like. You've got big ideas and big plans, you know what I mean? And, and you want to change the world, you know what I mean? Okay. You don't want to get caught, you want to be, you can operate in the dark and you're smooth and, and get a phone and switch it over. And um, when I got arrested, I knew, I knew it was um, it was on top when I got this phone call off one of the boxes. Didn't really get on with him. And he phoned me up and he was like, hey, I've got these trainees that you've left in, 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 in my tuk tuk last night he said I'll drop them off where are you and I'd only just woke up and I wasn't really like my bearings together and I told him where I was and like put the phone down and I, as I was coming around I was thinking that's a bit odd why is he phoning me why is he, is he offering tie, tie fella, yeah he was a tie fella yeah. so he grassed you up really yeah he, yeah, he blew me right up yeah he, um, I was like this is a bit odd you know what I mean why is he calling me a name I thought nah something, something's not right here yeah. So I got up and I had all kinds of like and loads of cannabis and, and tablets and I had a gun on the bed and I had I had a room full of weapons and no enemies, you know what I mean? It was like I was just that paranoid, it was just all over the gaff. Yeah. A pair of spears always on why I had them and I was on I can't even woke up with a pair of spears <laughs> always on. What the fuck's going on here? I was glad there really, because I started putting this tie stick cannabis, uh, concealing it in these little speeds holes. Plugged these drugs, uh seeing the gun, I thought that's that's there there's no winds out to throw that out yeah because what has happened is I'd looked out the door and I'd seen four and a response uh, running up the stairs and I just knew what the fuck that slammed the door she sat behind it and thought what am I fucking going to do yeah you know it's like, I don't wanna, no way out Bill there was no way out no definitely no way out so it was on the top floor the little winds was about so big you know what I mean it was just to keep the mosquitoes out so there was no way out Um and I was banging on the door and he was saying it's the police and I went, no, I don't believe you. Throw I was just stalling for time. Yeah. And he came in and, you know, and uh, the rest kind of like, that was it. It was like, oh, was the arrested. police like with you, with you very kind of like, manhandled you very heavy Yeah, they were, you. manhandled me, yeah. uh, trying to, threatening me to, to sign documents that I couldn't read or understand. Um, had me in this room for hours and hours on end. You know, it was like a, it, very dark with a little light that used to swing. What are they trying to charge you with at this point? Trying to charge me with um, I couldn't understand what they were trying to charge me with, but they were pointing that. They had me, they had me in the paper. I've got the clip in there at home, yeah. right? They had me in the front of the, like the national newspaper in Thailand with Sylvester Stallone stands in there and me with my arm around him, and then a little picture of me pointing at my bike, my motorbike. I bought the bike. Mm. Um, because what they do, that's the evidence you point, that's your charge with it, you know what I mean? There's no kind of like a criminal process of, mm. of how they deal with things. What were they saying with the bike as though the bike was kind of like your vehicle for drug dealing or... No, I was saying it was, of... I was stolen. I was stolen? Like, no, 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 it wasn't. And, you know, I paid cash for it and I bought it from like a shop anyway, so that was covered. Looking back, 
Bill, do you think this guy definitely kind of blew you up, crashed you up? And can you remember how did you fall out with him? What what do you think caused all that? Or was he just kind of a jealousy thing, just didn't like you? Yeah, he was getting little bits off me and, you know, and then he'd ask and he wouldn't, he couldn't pay and I just told him, no, nah, I can't afford that. I think it was just like, you know... Did you give him a belt at all? No, Bill, no. no. I used to belt him in the ring a lot. Like, yeah. I was a bad eh? but no, I just like refused him. Refused drugs. Used to, you know, he'd, he'd want sick and he wanted on his strap and he'd always want it free and I just couldn't afford it. Um, it, 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 it didn't really matter. I just think. Oh, but the, the, the kind of like chain of events, if he wouldn't have kind of blew you up, crashed you up. I think he'd have crashed no, me up. Anyway. He may still, yeah. still have been there now. Yeah, just, yeah I think it's the strange, the, isn't it? Yeah, the police, I think the police would have asked him anyway. And he, he so was, did you actually go to court after all this, Bill, or did you just go straight to. No, I was a court. I had the process of going to court. Uh, and it was like the most bizarre thing ever because like I'd gone into the prison, you know, not knowing what to expect. I've got shackles on my ankles. I've got I've been told to strip naked. Mm. Uh, they put these shackles on with little shorts, put in a cell with 80 other people, sleeping on a floor uh, next to a guy who died. As per the movie, Billy, is that true? The way that you were just like that many fellas lying in one cell? That's you that, just yeah. just lying on the floor? That scene is exactly how it was because I, I, I spent a lot of time with uh, Jonathan Ashby and he's the writer uh, yeah. and the director. And, you know, I worked alongside that script from day one. So it's authentic? Yeah. yeah. It's transparent. It's authentic. To say, when you've gone in in the first place, are you thinking, what the fucking hell is going on here? I was just like fucking shocked and numb and um, you scared Bill? yeah I'm scared uh, but I'm acting tough at the same time because mm. you got it yeah because I, I had the um, the understanding that I've been away before and he's a kind of like put that mask on again pretend yeah. here you know show no vulnerability show no weakness uh, and I went in and it was like it was frightening it was stinking um, there was limbs everywhere it was like a mass grave of people just on the floor uh, and, I, and I was like, I'm a fucking gonna survive. Did they resent you? Do you think as being a Westerner, really, or did not come into it? You were just another prisoner. No, nah, it's like I was definitely different. I was definitely yeah. ousted as well. You know what I mean? Did you, you feel like from as soon as you yeah, came in, like it's like all eyeballs on you. You know what I mean? Oh, it's yeah. like any other Westerners in there, or just you? Really? Yeah, there was a few Westerners in there, but I really, I never really got on with them. I had, my first fight was with three Westerners. You know what I mean? Um, over two other Westerners. Me being a rebel without a cause, didn't like the fact that they were bullying these older guys and, you know, being in there a week and I'm telling them, look, we should stick together, you know. You know, we shouldn't start, like, picking on our own and, who are you talking to? It was an, it was two Australians and an, an Iranian guy that I ended up fighting with over, on, on, on yeah. the, in the first week. Hey. And what were the, you didn't get on with the Aussies? No, really, not really. Got I, Bruce? No. <laughs> How's a dinger? No. But these ones anyway. Um, so the mask's back on at that point. Yeah. Acting tough again. In this place that's, you know, is, is a million miles away from the prisons you've been in, in oh, the UK. It's, yeah, it's, it's like this, this... When you were actually sentenced, but did you have any representation, a lawyer or... Did, no. Not, nothing? No, I was just stuck in a dock with, a, with, a, with, a, with about 25 other inmates. And there was one judge and he was just saying a sentence, by sentence, by sentence and people just going down then he comes to me said something and I got led away I was like what happened there so did you know how long you were going to be in there no, for no. didn't tell me for about a month and a half or something yeah. six weeks later I was like how long have I got what, what happened there you know what I mean he said you got three years he said about four he went handling stolen goods that was that yeah so I mean for people who've, who've read the book watched the film and stuff you know, you're talking about how authentic it is. I mean, it's quite harrowing, like, the, the conditions that you were in. Yeah, well, that prison that they, they shot it in, the Compatom, hmm. that's on the outskirts of Bangkok. That was an abandoned prison Yeah. that the director got uh, the use of. Um, and he's filled it up with ex-inmates. Ex you know, ex so they were actually ex-inmates, yeah? Yeah, they, they, were, um, they were actually inmates who, who well, ex-inmates who were um, gang members. Okay. So he's got non-actors as well as actors involved. Right. So he's got lots of extras. So it's really authentic. Um, that guy with the tattoos on his face, he was... Um, 
he's a famous quite a, quite yeah, famous he's, 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 he's scary looking fellas yeah, though, yeah, they're, they're small but like they're in gangs and, and they're very volatile and violent um, you know full of HIV um, you know I was subjected to threats of like um, violence uh, rape you know to, I was even to be injected with with a death sentence with HIV because um, I was getting myself in debt I was getting Involved with drugs again. Um, I, I couldn't face reality. I didn't want to be in that fucking prison. It was mm. fucking horrible. Were um, drugs freely available? You could get all of something all the time. And yeah, in, but you just ended up massive amounts of debt. Um, uh, but you just don't care when you're using. Anything to escape. You but know. Did you have access to anyone? Money bringing you any funds in at all, or nothing at the time? I was. Yeah, uh, we were getting like shutting off prisoners abroad once a month. A charity, two thousand baht, about thirty quid a month. Mm. Uh, the, the embassy was supplying us like um, protein tablets and vitamins yeah um, stamps and stuff that we could sell them so anything I ever got I'd sell you know what I mean British embassy did, did you ever see anyone from the embassy or anything like yeah, that yeah we said it I wasn't even a British uh, was, they weren't even British they were Thai yeah <laughs> or an Australian Kate Deval I remember her Garay Bill she was Australian she came to see me um, and you just said you got you got stuff off the embassy, but you'd sell it. Yeah, yeah, all the protein tablets that I'd get. They just got I just fun me me drug habit in there. So from day to day, you know, on a day to day basis, what would happen? But kind of like when you got up, did everybody wake early and did you go and get a wash or was there any breakfast? What was the, the first, food like? The first thing you'd do is like you, you know, they'd be walking across the shelves with the bands and waking everyone up in the bars. Um, just like the film. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. like the film. The whistle would get blown. You'd, uh, you'd all march out to the shard. Mm. At 8 a.m., you'd stand uh, and salute the national anthem and have to sing it. Na 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 uh, through the day you know you get one meal in the morning which is like chicken heads and, 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 and it was horrible like sticky rice and chicken heads chicken heads you're and, kidding yeah and chicken feet and, and were they kind of like with the chicken head not with the, the eyes or anything the, yeah the, the first one I had right, was like fucking joking it has a more weekend Right, oh so my put god a, put a spoon in this this bowl right and so was like uh, and I was I was like what no way and this side guy was like, there's a salon sitting in this side guy. I went, ah, I, you know what I have? And she started just shucking on its head. Fucking I was, um, hell. There was like, um, it, was just like it was just constant sticky rice, um, fish head soup, um, the stuff that you could Did eat. you learn to like it? Like? Nah, I never liked it. Did you start it. eating nah, it in the end? I actually had no choice. I was hungry. I was like, really emsicated. And, um, what was it like, the chicken's head? No, nah, I didn't eat that. No. I just had the soup. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, stuff, oh, yeah, just like work my way around her. Well, you know, um, like people would come up and visit, um, like missionaries, and buy you stuff. You know, um, like noodles and milk, uh, and fruit and bread twice a week. So we'd get that as well, and, and that. These are like, kind of just, just kind of souls, really yeah, kind of souls, yeah, souls, yeah, yeah. Just come up, Westerners, yeah, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was, there was a. a, a Catherine from uh, New Zealand that she come off for like the whole time I was there and used to support all the foreigners. You know, they get funded. Yeah. You know I mean? they, they'd have charities and they'd support, they'd come and visit the foreigners, you know what I mean? And, and give them food and that. And um, you know, and I, I learned to survive. Um I got in in, in a lot of fights in there uh, due to the language barrier and the way I'd react and, and I knew um, you know. I'm not seeking any any shit off anyone. And How did you communicate? Like when you're in there, if could any of them speak any English? Dead pigeon English. It was like mostly the lazy boys you'd learn it from the bars. But um, yeah. I started to um, there was a few people that could speak English, and I just sat with them and started learning to speak Thai, and you know, and and, and it became like put past a Thai day cap, cup and cap, and I started to learn it. So like fluent in the language and I started to read and write it then. You're fluent in it now? Yeah. So 
Ik heb een bad besteed, ik heb een bad besteed, ik heb een bad besteed, ik heb een So, at that point, are you like a loner in there? Like it's betrayed, or are you like, uh, have you got friends and stuff? Nah, I'm, I'm, no. I'm just on my own. But, um, yeah. The only friend he had was um, was uh, one prison officer, Officer Prezit, and he spoke English, and he'd sit me in his office, and I'd be sitting on the floor in front of him, and he going, okay, I want to speak English, and, you know, I'll learn you some time, and yeah. he'd, he'd converse, and, you know, we'd go, like, you know, put past a tie, uh, so papna, and I mean like let's speak Thai very politely because I'd been learning like ragar Thai, right? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> right. like the language the, the dialogue, and the yeah. dialogue, yeah. And he goes, no, no, put put a papna. So I started to learn from him, and and and, and you know he, I was getting involved in a lot of fights, and he said, look, you need to join a boxing team. Yeah. And uh, they were really like like really resisting. The fact that I was, you know, turning up, oh, we don't want him, he's crazy, you know, because I was known by this time as some crazy foreigner because I'd just get, in fight, get involved in fights and, you know, I'd have scars and my face stitched up with no anesthetic. And, um, so they had a boxing team in the... Yeah, yeah. Prison? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How often were they training and stuff like that? Were every they having day, fights with, with, within day. the... They were having uh, inter-prison fights. They were having, uh, like... Into, into prison fights they were having like show fights within the prison as well so okay. they, were having, they, were, they were having competitions against themselves as well you know what I mean yeah. as teams you know weighing each other up and, and getting involved and, you know I went along and I had to bribe myself in with a, with a can of cigarettes yeah it was just like the, the, the movie the film very authentic then Bill yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That's, the it's exactly as it was yeah I just said look and he come to the, the gate and he was telling me to go away and wrap a tag and you know, and I was saying, look, you know, I need to do something. I need to look and find that escapism again. You know what I mean? I was in debt. It pays all the debts off. You know, I couldn't get no more drugs. Um, but I mean, when you, you you beat up those two guys, the Muslims, the officer asked you to do it. Why did? What was his beef with them? That was um. That was actually, that actually never happened. Really? Yeah. That was um. Like there's a few. Even when I start thinking about the scenes, like the well, some lady, of it's been embroidered a yeah, little bit, yeah. yeah. Because I actually became a Muslim, which was odd. That's crazy. Like, yeah, um, isn't it Buddhism out there, or is it uh, the sudden uh, sudden size a, 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 a Muslim? Um, okay, yeah, and you've got like a central size. There's a small majority of a well, a minority of a, a Islamic size out there. But what happened was when I was in Bangkok. In the prison, I was walking around. I was hungry. You know, I was starving. Yeah, nothing. And um, these were eating. These these Muslims were all sitting there eating this wonderful kind of spread on this table. And I was just, you know, me, it was just like my soul was killing me. I just wanted something. You know what I mean? Why were they able to eat that food? And well, they just had it together, didn't they? They were just collectively as a unit. They were supporting each other. Okay. So they could get ties to get food brought in, like proper Thai meals and right. all that, and bringing it in. Well connected, yeah. Yeah, they were well connected, and I used to look at them, and they, you know, one of them invited me one day for a for a bit of food, and then I went, "All right, yeah." So I sat there with them. He said, "This is how we pray." So you know, I put my hands together, like you know, this is what we do in the UK. I'm I'm yeah. a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm religious in this way, and he went, "No, we do this." Um, I said, "All right, I've come back tomorrow." He went, "No," he said, "No," he said, "Eh." He said, only Muslims eat here. Okay. He said, but, you know, we, we fed you today because, you know, it was... Felt charitable, yeah. Yeah, they felt charitable and they were kind and hearted in that way. And um, I just turned up the next day with a sarong on. Changed my name to Yusuf Muhammad. From? What? Just got it off one of the guys. <laughs> yeah. And you, you what? You changed your name to what? Yusuf Muhammad. I was really? going to call him Muhammad Ali. So I went to him. So I changed my name to Yusuf Muhammad. Sat down with him. He never battled an eyelid. Well, here, Yusuf. And he said, no, you need to do a shahada. So I had to do a shahada with them. I said, what's that? I should do Allah, Allah, I should do Allah, Muhammad Rasul, and let Nabi Muhammad Rasul. So I had to do this, like, this recite, this, 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 uh, this, this prayer from the Quran. Just for a bit of food. Yeah. And then, um, you know. Is this towards the end of your sentence? Or? Yeah, yeah. So okay. then I'm in, um, then he moved for about the last year in my sentence, and then he moved me into this shell where I was a, uh, Getting up and doing a fadja with them, know what I mean? Bishmila Hirakman the Rahim Maliki Omadini Yaga. So I was learning like Arabic and uh, and reading the Quran and and 
you knew I was blagging it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, did know. you find it therapeutic, though, Bill? I did. Of things. Did you know it help what? you and the, the company that you were in? Yeah, because the boxing team had moved from one prison to another and the boxing team had kind of like, uh, there was no boxing team in, in Bangkok. Yeah. So I'm coming to the end of my sentence. I've got a year left of being moved to Bangkok. All them kind of friendships that I developed there, I, I, I've stopped. I got involved again in Bangkok. I witnessed murders, rapes, and everything whilst I was in this this prison in Bangkok. Yeah, and it was like I was next on the list. Are you still using it at this point? Eh, uh, I'm all stopped. Okay, but you know your injury, built You stuck when you did you crash your scooter or what happened? I come off a motorbike in Lao. Um, I was on the wrong side of the road. My fault totally. Um, and. As I turned to look, these two bikes were coming forward towards me and they hit me. And my bike is just smashed in half. I've got this scar that runs from here all the way around there. Um, the handlebar went right through my stomach. My God. Punctured my um, intestines, punctured my lung, crushed my ribs, and I ended up in a wheel battle getting rushed to this hospital in Lao. My God. I was put on the floor on a white mattress. I had loads of tablets on me like, that I was just bored. And I was, um, yeah, I was um, in hospital in Thailand for three months after that. Flipping it. Mm. How does it work out out there, but Are you supposed to finance it yourself, your hospital stay, or is it kind of... Yeah, I had to get out the window. Really? The day before the bell came. Did you? Yeah, I couldn't afford it. I was in there for a few months. Um, it was just like, this bell was massive. I was like, I'm going to pay that. He said, no problem. So I just got off. Just got off. You know what I mean? And then it was like, a couple of weeks later, I was arrested. And then oh, I'm, yeah. that's when I'm I'm shaving this time. You know what I mean? So heading back towards the end of your sentence, are you kind of like being very reflective at that point? And... I'm being... Um, or are you I'm, still in crazy conditions? No, I'm still in crazy conditions, but I'm in safe surroundings. Okay. Um, I'm eating well now. Uh, I'm getting fed. I'm drinking well. Um, I'm not using. I'm asking questions. Uh, I'm building relationships up with friends. And I was like, I'm very inquisitive. I was like, that's these like these Muslims, you know, because always by my my head, I was closed minded, you know. So what is it that with the backpacks and you're blowing everyone up and all that? You know, like, really, Bill? Did yeah, you question I them? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm here. I'm having a bit of scrimmages and all that, but I'm hearing all kinds of rumors around the world. What's going on? Yeah, because I was closed minded. Yeah. And they were saying to me, like, you know, you know, with the jihads and all that, he said the jihad is like the fight within. And I realised that was like the fight that I was having within myself. Um, it wasn't like, they knew that I wasn't a practising Muslim. Yeah. yeah. That I was... Blind. Well, they must have liked you, Billy. He talks to you, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know why, but... I, I, it was only just one of them, one of the guys that I kind of like, kind of liked me very really well, you know what I mean? Um Started chatting away with him. But all this, when you were kind of like, all this with your injury and everything, this was all kind of like intertwined with the, the fight, the boxing match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. In, the, in the movie anyway. Now, is, is, is that kind of like true really, the, the, the storyline? Yeah, the storyline. Yeah, because it was in Chiang Mai and I was fighting a guy, uh, one of their best guys at the time. I mean, um, I had this injury, you know what I mean? I mean, the director's obviously portrayed it a little bit. Of course, You know, yeah. he's, he's, he's turned it into a big match. Was there someone in the same prison or were you fighting another prisoner? In the same thing? prison. Yeah. You know, they'd never moved me to but another he, prison. But, he, but he, not the guy that you fought, he was, he was from the same prison, yeah? Yeah, yeah. But was he kind of heavy duty? Yeah, he was, yeah, yeah, he hated foreign as well. He hated, he'd call me like, hey, quiet. What, what's he calling me? He said, he's calling you a buffalo. I was like, all right, Sarah. Always done that. Buffalo, the buffalo what? Well, that's it. It was like probably the, it was like the like, like an insult they it's thought, the, yeah. yeah it's the, like you're a tick, useless, you know, animal basically. Got you. But it was like the the heaviest insult you could ever call anyone in Thailand. Okay. Yeah, if you call anyone a buffalo in Thailand, it's like really bad. So, Bill, I guess it you know culminates in in you kind of like coming off the drug use and and. I suppose finding yourself a little bit with these Muslim people. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. I just felt safe. I was just keeping the engine room alive. Yeah. Um, I knew I was getting fed. I wasn't taking any drugs, and I was coming to the end of my sentence, and I just wanted to get home. Yeah. To my family, mm. so I was just like, I was just doing the best I could uh, with what I had. Um, 
when did you take bad pill when you ended up in the hospital again, you know? And when you escaped from the hospital, when did you actually, your stomach injury flare up again? Was that during the fight or did you, did you in the no, movie was, you, um, you took blows to the, during the fight, didn't you? That was, whilst, that was whilst, it was the first couple of months whilst I was in hospital. Mm. Because I'd come off the bike in Laos, got arrested a couple of weeks later. I still, I was still fresh and I still felt pain, mm. you know, and I went to, um, I spoke to the embassy about it and they said, look, you know, We'll do our best to get you to an hospital. And they got me to an hospital. So it was the early doors of my sentence. And I was I remember I was on like the seventh floor of this hospital in Chiang Mai. And this this prison officer had just come once a day, every 12 hours, he'd come in and pop his head in and you know, and I wouldn't see him again. He was dying for a ciggy at the time. And uh, that's a thousand bars off Catherine. When well, she'd come up to see me, you know, fruit and she was buying me fruit, and you know, I was there for a couple of weeks. And uh, I had this money. She said, just buy yourself some bits when they come round with the little baskets. Yeah. And um, got out of bed to go for a piss. No one was about seeing an exit, so I was going down there. Went down the stairs, opened the bottom of the uh, exit, and I'm out in this, in, in this like, this, this grassy verge. People were sitting on the, on the grass eating, like, like, having picnics and eating bits in all size, families. Yeah. Uh, and I could see a 7 Eleven over the road, past the gates. I'm going there. Eh? I never got to the 7 Eleven. I stopped at the pharmacy and bought 100 Samadol tablets instead. I got back, scared that I'd get caught. And yeah. I sent someone over, some Thai guy, to get me a bottle of whiskey and a. Uh, <laughs> bizarre, man. Yeah. And, and some cigarettes. And uh, I had them smuggling back upstairs, a couple of days on, the, on these tablets, just sleeping, uh, smoking away downstairs, done the whiskey. And. and uh, it was like one night, two o'clock in the morning. Everything was gone. No more fucking painkillers. As I'm getting off. Because I knew I was going back to the prison. I thought, oh, I'm not having this. I had shackles on my ankles. And it was like, they had like sheets wrapped around it because they were making noises through the night and it was making mm. everyone up. Did you have a plan? Bill? What were you going to do? Nah, when you escape? No, <laughs> no, nothing. <laughs> no <laughs> contacts or nothing. No, you know. no, no, give a fuck. no one cares where I was at the time. Yeah. And nothing. The plan was all my own in my head. Oh. Um, I went down the stairs with the sharong on. Uh, these these chains wrapped in this these bandages to reduce the noise. Pair of flip flops. It was two in the morning. I went out the door. It was dead quiet. There was just no one out there at all. Walked to the the, the chain link fence, climbs over it, and starts walking away from the hospital. Just walking and walking and walking. Yeah. And it was about an hour. And I, I was thinking, where am I going to go? Yeah. What am I going to do? No one's going to take me in. I've got these on me. I can't take a bike. I can't. What's The only option was like, go back. Because mm. um, I'm going to need to get 25 years on top of me sentence or shot on, on site. Oh, yeah. for, for, for oh you would have got 25 years? Yeah. yeah for more? Get, yeah. Th- these two for, for attempting to escape. Yeah. And in the movie, Bill, or, uh, uh, what I read as well, as an escape prisoner, they could have shot you. Yeah. Legally, couldn't yeah, they? Yeah, they could have shot you legally, shot. yeah. Yeah, yeah. 25 years, escaping from the kings, you know, one of the kings. Of the, yeah, yeah. The, the big thing over there. Uh, and so I just walked back. Uh, Did they know you'd gone by then? No. When you got back? No, no you got no. away with it. Got away with it. Just got back. How long, how long back were you out for? About three hours. Yeah. yeah. Climb back over the chain link fence. Did you enjoy being out though or did it, did it make you feel a bit better? I was or? just walking. Yeah, I was just walking in the silence, in the streets, free mm. in a sense. With like stray dogs running up and down past me, all cats. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just looked at sight in this like hospital gown. Just thought, this is fucking madness, this. I went back. Just went back, walked back. Uh, went back to bed, and no, then the no, very next nobody day, nobody was any the wiser. No, no one was the wiser. No, the next day they just they took me from the the, the the hospital back to the prison. Then it's just that that's a face up to the sentence. Uh, I healed a bit and then started getting in, in, involved with the boxing, and you know, and, and the doctors were saying you can't really fight no more with this. Mm. I just didn't want to stop. You know what I mean? But I took a few blows there. You know. That had me like. How oh, is it blood. now, Bill? Is it is it still kind of a tender spot, a weak spot, really, with you? I'll show you after. Yeah. After yeah. after uh, we finish, you. It's it's quite like. 
It's quite like it. Do you ever get any pain now or no, no, not no, really, no. 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 So, uh, how did it end up with you coming, with you coming out in the end? I had a repatriation back to the UK. Yeah, uh, a compassionate one because of the injuries. Was this an extradition treaty kind of thing between Thailand and, and the yeah, UK? Yeah, yeah. So we, we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll extradite him. Well, not extradite. It's just a um, repatriation. Did so. you apply for that yourself? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I asked for it. Yeah, they come really come at the end of the sentence. I mean, you know, the red tape and that. Yeah. You have to do so much in Thailand and then it comes. And then um, two prison officers flew over from the UK, from Bonsworth Prison, come into the, the prison in Bangkok, picked me up, took me to immigration, left me there till midnight, and then took me to the airport. And then I got from, like, a one-way flight to, to uh, Heathrow. Yeah. Taking off the plane last, and then oh, while well, I was on the runway, and then escorted to Wandsworth Prison. On the way March back, the when you flew back, but we, we were accompanied by the prison officers. Yeah, they took, the, they took the cuffs off me while I was on the plane. Did they? Uh, they cuffed me going on first. Yeah. Took them off, and then cuffed me going off. So, really, the, the, the other passengers they weren't really aware that there was a prisoner on board. No, you know, no. Kind of they were interested in, in, in yeah. prison. Prison attire. Just in civvies, yeah. Just civvies, yeah. They weren't um, making it known. And they were quite okay. And, and I was, you know, I was eating, like, all the, you know, the food that was getting dished out. So then when you got to Heathrow, what happened then? Got picked up off the runway after all the passengers had gone down off, what have you, they, they took me down the, the back steps. A little prison bus picked me up and then took me to Wellsworth Prison and processed me. It's just like, and what was that like compared to the prisons that you'd been in in Thailand? That was totally different. It was like people had Xboxes and tellies and radios and got fed hot meals and, you know, beds. I slept on the floor for years with a toilet roll for a pillow. And you were speaking uh, English as well to so everyone? Yeah, no, but I was like, it was like dead difficult because I'd, I'd learned Thai and I was speaking Thai constantly. Really? Um, yeah. So it was a readjust was hard? It was readjusting was hard. Um, found that really difficult. And um, kind of um, just just kind of had to process a lot really while I was there. The culture shock. There was a lot of like uh, comparisons and differences, and so and it, it just it was like this is like it was like paradise compared to where I'd been. You know what I mean? So at, Freezing, that, at that point, Bill, obviously you've been able to reflect on everything. Yeah, and you. Th- you know, did it dawn on you like flipping it? Did, did you feel like at that point, right now, I'm gonna start living as you were at that point in Thailand and, and after after all everything that you've been through and all this kind of like crazy stuff comes to this point? No, my mental health had suffered. I felt quite depressed and quite low and um you know, I had a culture shock, I felt different, you know, I was going at a zap back to the UK. I didn't wanna be here, I didn't wanna be there. Um in fact, I wanted to be back in Thailand at some point in my really, life. Yeah. Because it, I, I was conditioned by the stage. That's what you yeah, sure. really used, used to it. And, um, so no, I enjoyed Thailand and I enjoyed the people. It just didn't kind of... It was my behaviour that got me into these, these, mm. these, um, these, these predicaments. You know, everything I've done, you know, I have to take responsibility, you know. I wouldn't glamorise uh, crime or addiction. Um, or glorify it. But even so, Bill, just fast forward now to the book. Yeah. And then subsequently the movie. How did that kind of come about? I know that you were writing to, to publishers mm. about your, you know, your, your experience. Were you kind of convinced at first, you know, you, you knew it was a great story, you knew people would go for it, or, or were you kind of like half open, you know, someone would take interest? Yeah, well, everyone wants to write a book, don't they? That's yeah. that's safe. yeah. But I mean, your what had happened to you was totally unusual, wasn't it? You know, yeah. not ninety nine point nine percent of people had never gone happen to, is it? No one has yeah. a movie made. Yeah. You know, <laughs> unless you kind of like. Well, I I, I I I was like saying to, 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 to a few guys that you know I'm going to write a book, and they're going, "All right, yes, yeah, sounds." You know, and I'm going, "Well, I am." And he went, "Say, so." You know, I started because I'd, I'd journalised stuff and, you know, you know everything I'd witnessed, you know, and I'd kind of documented and they had evidence to support it. And then, yeah. you know, I'd never written a letter unless it was in Baxlang, you know, and I've, over the years, like I said, I'd got a TEFL, so it's English, it's a foreign language. Um, 
so I learned how to, to write like um, I was very descriptive so I started to write um, just detailed information about like experiences and feelings and senses and how it was and um, get really honest you know my biggest tell people that my biggest fear was falling in love with a fella called Tiffany you know I did change my name to Yusuf Muhammad for a bit of food uh, and it's just all stuff that I, I didn't like have the courage to, to kind of like to tell people but I thought to be judged you know tell people yeah I'm not an hard case and I did get battered a lot but it didn't go down you know what I mean yeah. where did the title of Prayer Before Dawn come from Bill because it, yeah that's an interesting uh, everyone in the morning when I was away you know I'd get woken up by prayers and I was like an atheist you know I wasn't believing in nothing by this time you yeah. know what I mean and I'm in this prison at 20,000 inmates three different prisons within this complex and I do you now, Sigalina, every morning. Yeah. Before the sun, you know, as it was rising. And it was the Buddhist, you know, praying um, every morning. And, and then you'd have the uh, the Muslims praying the Fajr. Uh, Allah. So everyone was praying just as the sun was rising. I get it, yeah. And uh, they'd wake me up and they'd annoy the life out of me. And I, fuck, I was lying here in one's way. I'm thinking, I'm going to need a title for this book. I thought I prayed before dawn and I just stuck and I wrote this Shechem on and it's called uh, Surrender from the Heart I like writing but I also kind of like uh, need time to do it and you know I've just finished this other one as well and this is like a follow on from the first about like what's happened in the, in, in, in the, in the, the 10 years okay. since uh, can you remember where you were and what you were doing when you got the news that they wanted to turn a book into a movie you know yeah they turned up at their door and um I wasn't really shabby in the industry and I, and I shined uh, on the dotted line when I shouldn't have and I didn't have an agent and, you know, I got misled in some areas and that's, you know, that's, that's what happens. That's and, the regret that you've got as a person. Yeah, you know, I didn't get, you know, got a poor percent and, you know, I didn't think it was going to be a book, never mind a movie. Of Someone course. goes, we're going to make a movie about your life, Will. Of course. Fuck oh, off. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Oh, we yeah. are. And it's going to star this guy and you're going, all right, yeah. Was there a French company that had knows a lot of French names? Yeah, credits, it was like a co you know? it was a coalition. It was a uh, Indochina, French and, and UK. So there was like a uh, there was there was like Signorita Films, uh, Hanway, Altitude. Uh, there was a lot of production companies involved. Indochina Productions, you know, and then raising money and you know and, and financing a film was like you know you, you, I think it was one point two million to make. You know, and it it, it done well. Yeah. You know, it looked like a ten million dollar movie because they were in the Philippines and he had like this prison where he had three thousand inmates as extras for nothing. Um, so that kind of added to to to, to the but film. But it put you up there with kind of like you're on a par really with like Billy A's from Midnight Express. Yeah, yeah. Where from now on, you know, anything can happen, Bill. You can yeah. get calls from anywhere yeah. to you know maybe do a series or do another book TV or whatever. You know, yeah. it, it's. It's kind of really, um, what's the word? It, it, it's kind of glamorised your whole life, really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's like... Some Made you say, famous. Yeah, it has, and some, you know, some people say, you know, is that a good thing? And like I said, sometimes it is. In the beginning, it elevated my ego, and I felt good with the attention, and, you know, and, and, and as time's gone on, it's like, you know, I'm just, I'm no different from anyone else, and I make mistakes, and, you know, and... Um, I end up in places that I don't want to be again and you know I just practice like I was two years clean yesterday right that was okay. I, I celebrated two years uh, abstinence you know and um, that's a massive achievement just to get a day for me was an achievement but I know I can and I will uh, not use on a daily basis um, and I've got an understanding and you know an awareness around stuff it's just that when I'm like reintroduced back to opiates through like uh, a diagnosis of a, a, a diagnosis of cancer, you know, it, it kind of it's like that 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 like uh, allergic reaction again, you know. So, oh, you're on morphine, Bill, when you when you had the operation. Yeah, I was on. Yeah, I was on tramadol injections. I was on diazepam. I was on chemotherapy. You know, and it was like fucking hell. This is it. Yeah, my life's gonna end again. And um, you know, it was just a. Another downward spiral. This is where my second, my second book's coming. You know what I mean? Because okay. a lot's happened, you know. I'm on the, I'm, you know, I've been on the red carpet in Cannes, you know, standing next to, to, to big hitters and, 
you know, then the next thing I'm in a crack down and the next road, and I scrape a tennis together and a Hugo Boss sucks so easel. <laughs> so, like, so Bill, just, you know, as we wrap things up now, throughout everything you've been through, you know, it's a, it's a really crazy story. And you sit there and you watch the film for the first time of someone playing you, Billy Moore, in your whole life has kind of played in front of you. Looking at that, it, how did that make you feel? Does, was it kind of surreal watching it back? It saddens me. It's like um, it's like a it's like I'm watching it's like a third person watching someone else's life and going, fucking, I root for him and I hope he gets his shit together. And I'm looking at him and I think, you know, but the reality of it is, it's me and it's like it's like I've had to go through all that to become who I am today. Um, you know, I regret like the harms have caused others. Uh, but you're here to tell a story, Bill. Yeah, you're here to, yeah. to tell a story, and it's a lesson in life for other people to to watch and to yeah. learn from. Yeah, but resilience. What I, what I try to do as well. What I try to do. That's another way that someone says to me resilience. You know what I mean? But what I try to do, and as I promise myself, is that you know I want to give something back to the community and something back to you know society as a whole, and you know, and I get myself involved and I volunteer for this this, this rotunda. You know, uh, the ABC, it's it's an autism all-inclusive club. Okay. And that's me. Uh, and I go there every weekend, Saturday and Sunday, and give it me time. You know, my brother's got autism. You know, it, it, it brings a smile to me face to see these beautiful souls just light up. And, you know, you're there to give them your time. Yeah. You know, because I've took so much from society, you know. But I've given a lot back as well. I have. I've given a lot back over the years. I've made mistakes and I've amended them mistakes. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and people do change. This is what you know. What 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 I sign kind of like put out there. You know, I'm not I'm not me mistakes. I'm not me history. It was what it was. But today, you know, I, I do things that hopefully kind of uh, inspire others to change as well. Give them hope and and uh, and um, um, hope that they find like the opportunity to to also change. Because there's a lot of people like me out there that still haven't found a way out yeah. of that struggle, and that just lies down and gets stood on and let it be. You know what I mean? Where, like you said, then, well, resilience, you know, I want to stand up and I want to fight for something and, and I want to do something great with my life. I just don't want to be a stat and go, like, yeah, look. But it's very inspiring, though, mm. Bill, you know, to, to anybody who watches the book or hears the story or watches the movie, mm. what you've been through, how you've come through it, yeah, you know, kind of, you're still standing yeah. and it's a lesson to everybody and, and I think, uh, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Still got me mental health intact. Still have a laugh, still enjoy life. You know, and I'm, I'm doing a bit of acting now, and the first audition he had, I got it, and he got nominated for an award, I believe. So there's really? things that, you know, we've won a British International Film Festival Awards, or whatever. You know, there's things that are great, but there's loads of gaps in my life where, like, like I was saying to Will and yourself, there's nothing happening. Like it's not said, an ideal world. It's not as <laughs> no, but Bill, having said that, would you rather have been like the boy next door who got a job when he was sixteen as an apprentice yeah, bricklayer? It's definitely, and, definitely, you know, um, definitely colourful, like isn't it. It's I've enjoyed it. I've totally been. off the wall. Yeah, and it's been you know you've come through it. You've gone through it. You're a, you, you you know you're a legend. It's great. Thank well, you I very think much. you know. Thanks very much for your time today, Bill. It's been thanks brilliant well. and. Uh, I hope everyone watching this can understand, you know, get be inspired by the resilience. That's what that's what I got from it, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who were in similar positions to what how you you were in in really dark places, feeling vulnerable, feeling like they can't, you know, look for help. And I mean, to those people, would what advice would you give them, Bill? Or connect and reach out. You know, just don't suffer in silence. You know, if you've got something going on, it's like it. It's best shared, you know what I mean? Be open, don't be afraid of telling someone that, like, you know, that, that things are really getting you down, you know what I mean? Yeah. Don't have that mask. Just, that's you know, what you said before, where it's just like, take away the mask. We've only here for a few short decades. Yeah. yeah. Just fucking enjoy it, man. You know what I mean? That's what I say. Take the mask off. Take right, the mask well, off. Uh, thanks so much for your time. I hope Bill, everyone enjoyed this. Thanks for coming this. along. It's been fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, we it's lovely to meet you both. It really was. And, uh, yeah, I think... Uh, Got a bit of a friendship for life here now, haven't we? I think so. I'd like to think so. You look like that, Bill. Nice one. Right. (laughs) Thanks very much, everyone. Make sure if you're watching this on YouTube, you give us a big thumbs up uh, and subscribe and comment. Um, You know, 
But as we said, very, very inspiring story. Pleasure to have Billy Billy with us Moore, today. Prayer Before Dawn. Watch the movie. Fantastic. Look out for the second book coming. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys.